Okay, the big reminders for today are the exam is due Friday by 10. Okay, big one there is if you're doing it for a college grade, um, for the three of you, um, that's your cutoff time. Out of the entire class, two people haven't even looked at the exam, and only three of you have came in to ask questions about it or the homeworks that lead up to it. I can do similar problems to assist you during office hours. Uh, report cards are finalized next Wednesday at three o'clock. Um, we still have five more things that will be going in there. The chapter four homework is not due until after um, Wednesday. Chapter four homework is due next Friday. Um, you guys do not have school next Thursday because that is our putting report card grades into the system. So you can check uh, your status of what you're missing and stuff like that. So first thing I would like you guys to do is in chat, think about this. Tell me how these two graphs are the same and tell me how they are different. So type some ideas into chat. How are they the same and how are they different? And I will go mark the other person there. So we did get another drop in. And how are they the same and how are they different? And I got, so far I see different numbers, same shape, middle thingy in different spots. Okay, I'm seeing good answers there. So the key terminology that we have discussed so far when we want to describe something in our statistics class, we want to describe its shape. We want to describe its center and its spread. These are the key things that we are describing in statistics. Its shape, its center, and its spread. Okay, so for the shape, they have the same shape. And I see that um, somebody put in the word bell curve. Um, we'll talk about what that is. The person that just popped in, I will mark you present. And do a quick check to see if the last one showed up, not yet. Okay, um, there is another, there's actually two other names for this curve. One is called the normal distribution curve. Another name for it, it's a Gaussian distribution named after Gauss. And if you had me for algebra one, use that little kid, that teacher, asked him to add the numbers one through a hundred and in a couple seconds he gave the number 50 50 and the teacher thought he was wrong and went back and at, and teacher went back and added them up he came up with a shortcut for it he's a famous mathematician probably the one that um has come up with the most stuff that we actually still use so we talk about the center um so, and when we're dealing with the center, some other things is we talked about is modality. And both of these are unimodal, which means they have one mode. Um, the numbers for the centers, okay? We have the number zero and we have the number 19. Okay, the spread on these, well, the first one goes from negative three to three, what we see most of it is between negative three and three, so it has a spread of six. The other one, most of the numbers go between seven and 31, so it would have a spread of 24. So one thing I want you to notice is that the heights of these two graphs, the way I have them drawn, are the same. However, we're gonna find out in this normal distribution, oops, how did that slide over? Okay, in a normal distribution, the area 
under the curve is equal to one, which in our which to us means one hundred percent. So if the area under the first curve is equal to one and it only has like a six unit spread and the area under the other one that has a 24 unit spread has to add up to one. If we are actually to draw them on the same scale, the peak on the first one would actually be higher than the peak on the second one because the entire area underneath each curve has to add up to one. Okay, and that, that's because these are probability distribution curves and we want to figure out the entire probability. Okay, so we are going to talk about our normal curve. If we have a normal distribution curve, which is this, un, which you guys call the bell-shaped curve, which is unimodal, okay, and it's got equal distribution on the left and the right of the center. This represents the entire population. Okay, this is a curve of a population. And from previous chapters, when we have a population, we have parameters. Okay, so key term population gives us parameters. On a side note, if I want to take a sample of something, starts with the letter S, I get a statistic. Okay. Samples give us statistics, populations give us parameters. Two of the population parameters that we have are mu, which it, for us is going to be the center, or we will call the population mean. And the lowercase sigma, which is the standard deviation. Or I gotta put population in front of it. It's the population standard deviation. If I tell you that a curve, that a population is approximately normal, has a population mean of a number and a standard deviation of another number, you should be able to come up with a rough approximation of the curve. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do some practice with this shorthand. So if I want to just write down that I have a normal distribution with a mean of five and a standard deviation of three, I would put the letter N and I would put mu equals five comma sigma equals three. Okay, for the second one, mean of negative 100 and standard deviation of 10, that would be N mu equals negative 100, sigma equals 10. And the last one, N mu equals two, Sigma equals nine. So when you see questions in uh, journal articles or um, the homework, tests, quizzes, stuff like that, and you see this in with two numbers in it, the first number is the population mean, the second number is the population standard deviation. Okay, We're, what that does to help us is we want to, let me go back to this curve really quick. Um, I'm gonna do this one right here, this first one. So if I know that mu is five and I have a standard deviation of three, that would be one standard deviation out, that's eight, 11, 14, and if I go one standard deviation in the negative, that would be two. Another standard deviation in the negative, that would be negative one. Another one in the negative would be negative four. What this allows me to do is, let's say somebody scores a 10 on the test, which would be right about here. 
if I want to find out how many people did better than him, what percentage of people did better than him, I would find the area under the curve to the right. So to the right is better than 10. That would give me a percentage, percent better than 10. And let's say I wanted to know what percent got less than 10. I would figure out what the area underneath this curve all the way up to the 10 point is. And so the blue is the percent less than 10 on this. And we're going to figure out how to use the calculator and other tools to come up with those actual percentages. The first tool that we're going to use is a z-score. We're going to, you're going to see in a future slide that normal distributions, if I standardize them, I can get some good data. Okay. What a z-score is, is it's just scaling. <laughs> I'm going to take my, um, what number am I going to use? Letter am I going to use? I'm going to use my number minus the middle divided by the standard deviation. And let's see what this means for us. The standard deviation is how far on average the numbers spread away from the middle. That's the way you can think about it. Okay. So I'm going to show you what this means for me on two things. Let x represent a random variable, mu of 3, sigma of 2. Okay? So I'm going to just draw a graph. And I'm going to draw this. This is 3. And then if I go out a standard deviation, I'm going to go 5. If I go out another standard deviation, I'm going to go 7. That's because of this 2. If I go out another standard deviation, I'm going to go 9. If I go the other way, I'm going to go 1. I'm going to go negative 1 and then negative 3. Notice on here, on this graph, I'm going from negative 3 to 9. They want to suppose we observe x equals 5.19, which would be right here, somewhere right in here. Okay, what, an, what a z-score does for me, instead of me having this graph going from negative 3 to 9, a z-score standardizes all normal curves so the middle is 0 with a standard deviation of 1. So if you end up with a z-score that's negative, you're to the left of the middle. If you end up with a z-score that is positive, you're to the right of the middle. Okay, so all a z-score does is it changes the scaling to a normal distribution curve with a mu of zero and a standard deviation of one. So they want us to find the z-score of x. Well, x in our case was 5.19. z is equal to 5.19 minus mu, which is three, divided by the standard deviation. So that's 2.19 over 2, which is 1.095. So use the z-score to determine how many standard deviations ab above or below the mean falls. Well, um, x is 1.095 standard deviations above the mean. So when you calculate the z-score, it's telling you how many standard deviations your value is away from the mean. When you read journal articles or newspaper articles and stuff like that, they're gonna give you how far, you know, this data point was two standard deviations from the mean, okay? If you uh, get into theoretical physics, so when they went to go find the Higgs boson, um, they, they had a whole bunch of normally dist distributed stuff, and then they ended up with a weird set of data 
that was like five standard deviations away from the mean. So it was something that should not have appeared from what they were expecting. And that's how they were able to find something because that's like one in a billionth chance of something happening at five standard deviations out. It, and they ended up with a whole cluster of data. So they realized that there, there is something there and then they went to hone in on it. So the, close, the smaller your value of your Z-score is, the closer you are to the mean, and then the bigger absolute value of your Z-score, the farther away from the mean you are. So how do we use this? I'm gonna do some examples. Head lengths of a brush tail possum follow normal distribution with a mean of 92.6 millimeters and a standard deviation of 3.6. I would like you guys to calculate the Z-scores for those two things. I'm gonna give you guys a couple minutes before I walk through those. And the last person showed up. Yay. Okay, Z is X minus mu over sigma, or it's the population mean divided by the standard deviation for those letters. So for the first one, I get 95.4 divided by 92.6 divided by 3.6. Um, so 95.4 minus 92.6 equals divided by 3.6 equals. Oh, I hit 65. So 95.4. Minus 92.6 equals divided by 3.6. And I get 0 0.7 repeating. For the second one, it's 85.8 minus 92.6 divided by 3.6. So 85.8 minus 92.6 equals divided by 3.6, negative 1.8 repeating. So I've calculated two different z-scores. Which one is more unusual? The one that's more unusual is the one that has the greatest absolute value. So it would be the 85.8 millimeter because negative 1.8 is farther away from the center than the positive 0.7. Are there any questions on how to use a z-score to check how close something is to the center of the curve? So I'm gonna now teach you how to use the calculator to come up with some answers. The cumulative SAT scores are approximated well by a normal model with a mean of 1100 and a standard deviation of 200. Shannon is randomly a randomly selected SAT taker and nothing is known about her aptitude. What is the probability that she scores at least 1190 on her SATs? Here's the thing, anytime you're dealing with a normal distribution question, your first step is always to draw a basic normal distribution picture. So just draw a basic picture, put in the mean, 
put in the value that you want, and then ask yourself, which region of this curve am I asking myself to find the answer for? And I want to know whether she gets at least 1190. So I want to know this area under the curve, the right-hand portion of the area under the curve. So we are going to use the normal cumulative distribution function in your calculator. The way that you get to the normal accumulation, normal CDF function in your calculator is you hit second, the bar key, which gets you to distributions. So you should have your calculator out. Hit second bar, go down to the normal CDF and hit or hit the number two, and it's going to ask you some numbers. Okay, and the lower is the left-hand edge of the curve that you shaded, the upper is the right-hand edge of the curve you shaded. So if you're going from minimum up, you are gonna use, your lower is gonna be negative um, one E99 is what you did her there. If you're going um, up to some maximum number, your upper, is going to be 1 e to the 99, which is 1 with 99 zeros. So that gives you a really big number. All you're going to do is you are going to fill out the other numbers from your thing. My lower number of my shaded region is 1190. My upper number of my shaded region is 1 e to the 99. Very, very, very big number. Okay. My, my mean is 1100. My standard deviation is 200. I type those things in there and then I hit paste. So I hit 1190, one second EE to the 99, 1100, 200, go down to paste, hit enter again, and I get 0 0.3264. I would like everybody to go through that process and make sure you can get that 0 0.3264. Okay, so the one that just got the 326, you're gonna wanna hit mode and you're gonna wanna go down to make sure that float is highlighted and then hit enter. And then you can hit quit, which is the second, um, mode and then do it again and it should give you that the fourth decimal point uh, yours may be stuck in rounding okay good so what we're doing for these probability problems is we are basically trying to find a percentage area underneath the curve so the answer to this question is that there is a 32.6 percent chance that she scores at least 1190. Okay. So there's a 32.6% chance that she scores at least an 1190 on the SAT. The hardest part for this section is to understand, to, to understand which areas that you're actually calculating. Okay. That's why I tell you to always draw and label a picture of the normal distribution. That will help you out on all of these problems. Um, there is a video in my open math that walks through doing this, the normal CDF in the calculator again, if you forget how to, or I have my keystrokes listed on this slide, which will be shared with you that you can get through how I got the answer. So, um, based on a sample of 100 men, the heights of male adults in the U.S. is nearly normal with a mean of 70 inches and a standard deviation of 3.3 inches. Mike is 5 foot 7, that's 67 inches. Jose is 6 foot 4, which is 76 inches. And they both live in the U.S. I want to know Mike and Jose's percentile 
Okay. These are the percentages that they are taller than X number of people. Okay. And I also want to draw a picture for each part. So what I'm going to do to calculate a percentile, I have to do the opposite. In the previous problem, the green shaded region was 30, about 33%. If I were to shade to the left of this, that would be approximately 67%. So she would be in, a, in about the 67th percentile. So I have to work opposite to get my numbers. And we're gonna figure out how to use the calculator to do that in just a second. But the first thing I'm always gonna do is to draw my picture. So I'm gonna draw a picture for Mike and I'm gonna draw a picture for Jose. The middle number is always gonna be 70 inches. And Mike's number is 67. And Jose's number is 76. And the areas that I'm interested in are these. Okay, so I'm going from the lower bound to the upper bound. And if I wanna use the probability cumulative distribution function, the information for Mike that I would enter would be negative one E to the 99. That's my low end. Then my upper end for Mike, um, so this is low, upper, U-P-P-E-R, and for Mike is 67. Um, my mu is going to be the 70. And my standard deviation for all of these is 3.3. .3. So, and then for the only number that's gonna change for Jose is the 67 is gonna change to a 76. Okay, so I'm gonna put my negative one e to the 99, 67, 70, 3.3, .3. hit enter twice. So for Mike, I got 0 0.1817. For Jose, I'm only gonna change one of those numbers. And that's to a 76. and I get 0 0.9655. So what this is telling me is that Mike is taller than 18% of the people and Jose is taller than 96% of the people. Um, it's not the letter E. If To get the EE, -E, you hit second comma key. It's the blue letters above. Yeah, that, that E is the second, it's the EE. -E. You're looking for the EE, -E, which is above the comma key, which is right above the seven key. So you're gonna hit second, then the comma key, and that's gonna give you the EE -E in there. So the two that put that in there, Please see if you can get that. If worst comes to worst, I'll go over to the computer and share that screen. So the two that Yeah, because that's what that E, yeah, that's what that E, e means. Yeah. Um, that E is, uh, that E used to be for engineering notation, okay? And it's just so, it's a quick, because engineers always use scientific notation. So it was a easiest way on a calculator not to use two digits to represent, represent powers of 10. They could just use a single digit on the calculator to mean powers of 10. That's why that E is there.
for the two that weren't able, to, that got the errors, were you able to fix those? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, since one wasn't able to fix it, I'm gonna share my, I'm gonna boot up the calculator on my computer screen and hopefully you'll be able to see exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm gonna boot up the, this and I'll share it. Trial version. Okay, so meet, share my entire screen. Okay, so I'm going to clear my cal hit clear. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to the normal CDF function. To get there, I get the second, and then anytime I hit second, the words I describe are the blue letters. So I'm gonna hit distribution. I'm gonna hit down arrow once or type the number two to get to my normal cumulative distribution function and hit enter. Okay, so I'm gonna delete that stuff and I'm gonna retype it in. So for a lower limit, I'm gonna hit the negative, not the subtract. So another way you can get the syntax error is hitting the subtract. I'm gonna hit the negative, which is next to the enter key then I'm gonna put a one. And to get that E, I'm gonna hit the second key and then the comma key. And then I'm gonna put 99. Then I hit enter and then I'm gonna do Mike's. Mike's height was 67. So then I'm gonna type in the 67, hit enter. The mean height was uh, 70 inches. So I'm going to hit a 70 and enter. The standard deviation was 3.3 .3 inches. I hit enter. I'm going to hit enter for the paste. And then I'm going to just hit enter again. And that's where I got the 0.1817 for mine. So the last one that wasn't able to get it, we're able to get it now. Okay, that's the, that, That's why I mentioned that negative key versus the subtract, because that's the other place you can get the error. Um, yes, we are subtract, uh, we're negating the number there. Now, if I want to find the area between two numbers, again, step one is to always draw your distribution curve, draw your middle, Draw my two numbers, 69 and 74. Well, 69 would be about here, 74 would be about here, and the region I want is in between them. So you should be able to use the probability cumulative distribution function to calculate that. So I'm not gonna tell you what to type in, I'd like you to try to type it in on your own. I'll give you about a minute, then I'm going to put the answer up and see if you guys got that answer. So to four decimal points, I got uh, 0 0.5063. I need to know if there is anybody that did not get that number. Okay, it looks like we've got it. So here's where normal distributions are gonna help us. We can use some rules of thumb. 68% of all of the data is going to fall within one standard deviation. So this is a, I'm gonna put, so if I use a normal 
with a mu of zero and a standard deviation of one, I'm, all, I'm gonna relabel these also. What, what this one is, this gives me my z-score distribution. These three numbers are gonna become very, very important for us because it allows us to quickly come up with areas underneath curves if things fall on standard deviation boundaries. 68% of all data falls within one standard deviation. 95% falls within two standard deviations, and almost all of it falls within three. 99.7% falls within three standard deviations. We are going to see these three numbers pop up again in a future chapter, okay? These three numbers are gonna become very important for us. On the SAT and ACT, they expect you to know these three numbers, okay? Um, some books go out to more decimal points. Some books go out to less decimal points. The way you can come up with these numbers on your calculator, you can use your, prob uh, your normal CDF with the mu of zero standard deviation of one, and you can, let's just put, um, let's put from negative one to one in there. So if I go to my distribution function, uh, turn it back on, go to my distribution function, my lower limit's negative one, my upper limit is one, with a mu of zero, standard deviation of one, and I actually get 68.2689, something percent. So even if you don't have these memorized, if you know how to use the probability distribution function, the normal probability cumulative distribution function, you can still come up with them on your calculator. Okay, so if you read an article and they say that everything's within three standard deviations, that's pretty good. If they tell you something's like five standard deviations out, that's telling you that something is unusual. Anything beyond three is unusual. Okay? So, what I'm going to do is use something, use that thing to help me with this. So, it says SAT takers follow the normal model with a mu of 1100 and a standard deviation of 200. So, I draw my curve. I have 1100. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out three standard deviations. One, two, three. So that would be 1,300, 1,500, 1,700. I'm going to go three standard in the other way. 900, 700, and 500. About what percent score between 700 to 1,500? The 700 to 1,500 is this region right here. And that is two standard deviations out, and I know two standard deviations is 95%. Okay, what percentage score between 1100 and 1500? That would be just the right hand side of the two standard deviations. So half of the 95%, I believe is 47 and a half percent. Does anybody have any questions how I came up with those two numbers for my answers? Okay, we're almost done here. Just more examples. Has a mean of 27 and a standard deviation of five, five the, find the probability that a randomly selected value of X is on the given interval. First step, draw the graph. So that's too thick. So I have a normal distribution curve. It has a mean of 27 
and it has a standard deviation of five. So I'm gonna go 32, I'm gonna go 37, I'm gonna go 42. I can go to the left, which is 22, 17, 12. Okay, six. Between 22 and 32. If we go back to our curve, that's our 68%. Okay. So I am going to put 68%. For the next one, between 12 and 27, that is half of the 99.7%. So I'm gonna do 99.7 divided by two, and I get 49.85. Between 17 and 37, that is two standard deviations, which is my 95%. At least 22, this one is where it gets a little wonky on here. At least 22 is everything to the right here, okay? I will tell you that from here to the right is 50%. Ooh, let me make it less thick right there. Everything to the right of the middle is 50%. So that's 50%. Well, if these two add up to 68, that means this one is 34 and this second one is 34. So I'm gonna get the 50% plus the 34, which is 84%. So if I do 95 divided by two, subtract the 34, each one of these second ones are 13 and a half. And if I take 99.7 minus 95 divided by two, each one of these is 2.35. So using our general rules of thumb for normal distributions, those red numbers is how much each of those boxes are. So at least 37, that is gonna be a blue one again. The at least 37 is the stuff out here, which is 2.35%. And at most 32, which would be everything to the left this way. Two ways to do this. Well, actually I'm gonna get the 50% plus the 34, which is 84%. So the, if you know the 68, the 95, and the 99.7, you can come up with these numbers, okay? To me, if I know those numbers and everything is falling on a standard deviation boundary, it is quicker for me to come up with the answers without a calculator than typing these things into the calculator. Again, you could have answered every single one of these problems using the normal cumulative distribution function on your calculator, okay? However, if it's a non-calculator portion on the SAT, this is the way they would expect you to do it. And number 12. We're gonna go backwards here. Before, we were, we were able to calculate um, percentiles, somebody's percentile based off of things. Well, now if I give you a percentile, I want to be able to go back and figure out what they scored. So this one will help you out on your homework. I'm not using the, I'm not using the percentages on your homework, but um, you'll be able to do the same work. It says, assume that scores on the verbal portion of the GRE are normal with a mean of 151 and deviation of seven, and the quantitative are normal with 153 and 7.67. Find the score of a student who scored in the 75th percentile. So what I'm looking for is I want to find this score right here. Okay. Of the quantitative reasoning section. So quantitative reasoning has 153 and 7.67. 
Okay, the calculators that I gave you are um, a little more advanced than because they're the plus CEs. We're going to do the opposite of what we did with the cumulative distribution function. We're going to give the cumulative distribution function a percentage, and it's going to give us a score. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to hit second dist, which is above the bars key. So we hit second dist. And then you're going to go down to the number three. And this one says inverse normal. So hopefully the name of it is going to help you out. So just go down to three. The area for this case, so for us on this one, my area is going to be 0 0.75. My mu is 153. My standard deviation is 7.67. I do not care what you put for the tail. You can put anything for the tail, but um, once you get there and hit paste, don't hit enter a second time yet because we have to do something there. I don't care which tail you pick because we're going to end up deleting the tail when we get done. Okay, I'm going to go to the calculator on the screen again. So present now, entire screen, share, calculator. So I'm gonna clear this mess and I hit second bars, which is the distribution key. I go down to the number three, I hit enter and I'm gonna type 0.75 um, one, 153.7 and then 7.67 and I don't care which tail you have and I'm going to hit paste. Now here's the thing. We need to get rid of the tail to get our answer. So I'm going to hit left arrow until I get to the comma. Then I'm going to hit the delete key twice. So what it should look like, it should look like 0.75 comma 153.7 comma 7.67. And then when you hit enter, you will get your number. So if you hit that um, left arrow till you get to the comma, then you're gonna hit delete twice, then you can hit enter. And I get 158.17. For the second one, let's look at our little picture. I want to find the score of a student who scored worse than 85% of the test takers. We are looking for, in this case, the 15% number. Okay, so for the second one, you're going to do the exact same thing, except we have a different distribution because we are doing verbal reasoning now. Verbal reasoning has a mean of 151 and a standard deviation of 7. So I'd like you guys to try that one and make sure you get the same answer I did. Second, second, inverse, 0.15, 7, delete the tail and and hopefully everybody gets those two answers Gotta stop sharing there. There's my two answers in the answer boxes. Pop over. Yeah. 
I got two more little quick things to show you. I'm going to stop the recording for those two quick things so you guys can speak.